Did you know that you can combine 3D and photo stock assets in Photoshop without knowing how to use any 3D software? I've been using 3D assets from Adobe Stock and Neo Stock in my photo manipulation work for years and in this video I'll be showing you how to achieve hyper real results, no 3D software needed. <music> Hey guys, welcome to the video. My name is Dean Samet. I'm a pro book cover artist from the UK and you're tuned in to photomanipulation.com. So in this video, I'm going to be showing you how to use a CG elements, pre-rendered CG elements that you can easily get from stock websites such as Neo Stock or Adobe Stock and combine those elements in Photoshop to create hyper real results um, with photo stocks. So I've got a couple of galleries here. Now all of the CG elements that I'm using today are from Neo Stock. You'll find the links for those below. And then the photo stock elements like you see here are from Adobe Stock. So if you want any of these bits, just go to the description. I've listed everything for you. Okay, so what you saw at the beginning was a comp image where I've taken rough body parts and the elements that I want to splice together. I've chopped them out roughly with the lasso tool and got the positioning. So what you see there isn't actually the final artwork. All that is, is some elements put together in a rough manner, chopped out loosely with the lasso tool, so I can get the positioning and everything correct um, prior to undertaking the heavy lifting. Now, the process that I'm using here to cut out the female stock model head is my go-to method and I've created an entire tutorial on this that will be listed in the description below and the philosophy is really simple to cut out these solid areas I create a new selection layer and fill that with white so I usually use a pen tool for that and then using the freehand lasso I make another selection layer that has only got the soft areas in so that would be eyelashes eyebrows and hair so that's the method that I use and then I combine both of those selections to cut out the hair and the solid there's an entire tutorial on this that's listed below so if you want to learn this method of cutting out human heads that or bodies you can go ahead and check that out after this video so that's not the main thing we're covering in this video if you've got your own techniques for cutting out heads or figures you're more than welcome to use those no problem at all so that girl head has been properly cut out the hair is done well the eyebrow and the eyelash and now it's been positioned into place now the cg body was taken from one of the neo stock galleries uh, i believe that's um one of the the cyberpunk bodies that we have and then if you look behind the arm there's another cyborg pose um, that's in exactly the same pose because I wanted some mechanical elements coming out the back of the arm. So that's simply another stock image positioned behind and nudged over a bit. So what's going on here is the head is being transformed. The transform controls is I've got the layer group with all the head elements in and then it's simply command and T to use free transform. It will allow you to scale and rotate as you need. I'm on a Mac, so the shortcut is Command and T. If you're on a Windows, that's Control and T. Anytime you hear me saying Command, just switch that out for Control. So the head's in position, and then you may see me refer back now to the comp version just to get the positioning and think, yep, this goes here, that goes there. So I'm basically recreating the comp version but with the elements properly cut out as opposed to being rough and loose with the lasso tool. Now, when I showed the original uh, photo stock image, I looked at where the neckline was going and with the new version, it weren't perfect. So I simply cut out a piece from that cyberpunk body and then just transformed it and moved it into place so it, it matched the mechanics of the photo stock head a little bit better. Whenever you're in doubt, you can always hide and show the original and simply copy uh, the lines of the body. 
Now, this step that you see going on here isn't actually essential. What I'm doing is using the pen tool and tracing the outlines of all the panels that are white. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because I didn't want these um, panels to be a stark white. I wanted them to be a more muted gray to match the main cyberpunk body. So I've, as before, as with everything else, um, a new layer. There you can see panel mask. I filled that with white and that is my selection layer. Whenever I want to use that selection, I could just command and click on that layer icon and always come back to it. Now this is a really simple down and dirty trick. I don't think I use this in the end. I think I got rid of it, but I've simply duplicated the um, the white panel layer and set it to multiply and then duplicate the layer loads of times. I take a look, I think, is it good, is it not? Not overly happy, it's a bit too crispy. For this particular piece, as with lots of my artworks, it's all about being hyper real. And I didn't really get that hyper real vibe, so I went to the good old trusty go-to, dirty old levels. I know there's a lot of um, Photoshop instructors on YouTube that really don't like levels, but I really like levels because it's simple and I understand it and a lot of times it gets the job done for me so I use that selection layer and use levels to darken those panels and then another one of my go-to's is using the gradient map to add a, a black and white um, desaturation and then I just pull that opacity down to the point where I want it to be I don't want it to be a a hundred percent uh, monochromatic or black and white we just wanted to bring back some of those uh, blues that were evident there so to darken those panels it was a pen tool to create a selection of the panels new layer fill that with white so I can always go back to that selection and then darken with the levels and then on that same selection add a gradient map adjustment layer now my personal workflow is very adjustment layer centric. That's because I've got the layer masks on there and I can control um, where they're visible using the layer masks and also it's non-destructive. So if I decide I don't like it, at any point I can go back and tweak the values and any PS instructor on YouTube worth their salt will be pushing you towards a non-destructive workflow. Okay, so I'm talking all over this bit, but this is a really handy trick. Levels, make it dark, use a freehand lasso, draw a shape, filter, Gaussian blur, and then that's an instant shadow. So I referred back to the original stock image for, right, where does the shadow fall under the chin? Hid the original and then created um, a selection with that lasso. There you go, that's the original, that's hidden, and then I can say, yep, my shadow looks similar to the original. So when you're doing these kind of hyper-real composites, it's really good to keep referring back to the original, especially when it comes to copying shadows. And you'll see that coming up a lot in this piece. Um, with the uh, pads that go on the head with the wires, I had to refer back, here, here they are in action now, I had to refer back and look at the source image and think, right, where do the shadows fall? Because when I cut that out with the pen tool, um, I didn't take the shadows with it. So this is being dragged over and we're just using that as reference. We're having a look to see. Okay, so this is positioning. And when you're positioning things like this, sometimes it can be helpful to reduce the opacity of the underlying source image so you can match up the scale of the eyes, the top of the head to the chin. It's quite a nifty trick, a quite good go-to at times when you want to get things because um, getting scale and positioning with anatomical pieces can be really difficult because the human body instinct or the human mind instinctively knows when something doesn't look right. So that's a, a very common rookie mistake is getting the scale and position of anatomical elements incorrect. And you can instantly tell that it's, it's not right. 
So we're tweaking some of these bits here, creating selections and then moving and transforming as needed. And that's just being nudged into place and thinking, right, that works. You'll notice there to the right on the on the wires that they don't really connect up with the back of the neck or the back of the head. So this is a great trick. I love this. A selection made around that wire using a lasso. Duplicate that selection. So I like to use a command in J. Move it into position. Add a layer mask. Um, blend out the edge with a soft edge brush. So there's a be for brush and then just soften up that edge and then you instantly have an extension of that wire now i'm not a great digital painter and it would have taken me ages to digit digitally paint those wires so all i've done is duplicate the wires got them into position with free transform blended out the edge so there's no um, harsh edge so it just transitions seamlessly from one end to the other and then i repeat and then i repeat that process and there's a look at the layer mask in action you can see the layer mask in play there so these are just copied and pasted onto new layers tweaked and then this one's not quite perfect but you can see another trick that i do here so as before a layer mask just taper off that edge with a black soft edge brush this is Photoshop 101. Only basics. There's nothing fancy going on in this entire piece. It's all basics. It's adjustment layers and it's selections and it's processing. We're not really reinventing the wheel here. Okay. So a selection is made using a pencil. Right click, make selection and then hit delete on any bits you want to get rid of. And there's the wires connecting up with the back of the head. Now, of course, they're going over the ear and the chin. But put all of them into a group. And then you can add a layer mask to that. And then selectively hide and show what you want to be visible using that layer mask. It's all basics. So here we have a bit of a cleanup operation on those wires. I want one wire to go underneath the jawline. I want one wire to go behind the neck and have it a bit more kind of varied and dynamic. And that's what's going on here. A little bit of a cleanup. Kudos to you guys who have stuck with the video to this point. Yeah, I know it's a long one. It's a 40 minute beast, but there are so many tricks on display for this one. So I do hope that you stay with us to the end to really see this piece come together. And if you haven't already, please do like and subscribe. We're a new channel, so we can take all the support we can get. Okay, so the comp version, that was the rough mock-up, is just being hidden and shown, um, just to as a point of reference. The eyebrow was knocked out there simply using the patch tool. A selection drawn around the eyebrow, and then dragged up to a clean area where there's no hair, um, just a part of the skin. It's a really fast, really quick and dirty technique for getting rid of eyebrows. So we're developing that jawline. I have one of the um, Android or Cyborg elements from Neo Stock, and I want to take the jawline and that ball element that goes up by the ear. So this was cut out properly. It wasn't um, quickly hacked out with the lasso tool. Get that into position using the transform tools. A little tweak here, a little tweak there. And then hiding and showing that comp. So those comp images are really useful um, for giving you a, a direction. And you, you get the comp looking right. And then you can follow that lead when you go to cut out the elements properly and, and you actually invest time into making the piece look as good as it can be. Lots of pencil going on here. So the bits that I don't want are being knocked out using a layer mask and pencil. And then we've got the chin element there from another cyborg and then some simple uh, 
black filled in i think we're going to use some anatomical cheek muscles to go in within that black region so layer mask there pen tool to shape those bionic elements around the ears and then using the selections to remove the wires because the wires are going over that section so it can be uh, a little bit jenga with all of these different layers intersecting and entwining but with layer groups and masks you, you can achieve incredibly complex results so the bottom jaw and the bottom lip stolen from uh, that cg element positioned in place the head layer was used as a selection so to create a selection based on a on a layer of contents you hold down command and click on the layer icon and that's control if you're on a windows guys lips removed and then hiding and showing the comp version and the active version that we're working on just to make sure we're on the right track so this is the stage where i'm creating the black kind of a uh, strap that goes round to make it more visually interesting and anatomic and then the same is repeated for this side of the mouth selection made with the pencil and then filled with black on a new layer so this is the anatomical face that i had um, the muscle map that matches the angle and the pose of the model so a big part of this working process is matching those angles and getting everything um, it doesn't have to be a hundred percent perfect but it does have to be quite close in order for it to look real so in my personal work I like to go for a, a hyper real look it's quite sharp and you know it you you keep a lot of the photographic details but what I'm actually pushing towards is more digitally overpainted look so this is a shape being drawn with a pencil to create the kind of cheek region and then the muscle map you can see coming through there because we're on the muscle map layer and it has a layer mask and we're selectively adding and removing using black and white and this is the old classic go-to for shadows is levels i love to use levels for shadows that was similar to the uh, to the next shadow trick create a rough outline of the shadow with the lasso filter blur gaussian blur and then there you have your shadow and just getting rid of the bit that went over the lip there so we kept the model's lip we didn't we didn't um, hide it with the cyborg lip now this process is creating a selection layer based on the lips because i know i want to do some processing i don't want human looking pink lips so in order for me to work with this i want to have a selection so there you can go lips mask fill it with white and then at any time i can command and click on that layer icon and have that selection available now we've anatomic regions like lips and other areas sometimes it can be too sharp if you have no feather on the selection but you can simply go filter blur gaussian blur to um, soften the edges of that selection layer so this is a go-to for coloring this is an adjustment layer um, selective color and then tweaking those individual channels to get a very accurate there you go that's the, the gaussian blurring effect about 1.5 or two soften those edges up so selective color to tweak those elements and then we have a good old gradient map to reduce the intensity for some reason i really like to use gradient map black and white gradient map instead of hue saturation and just pulling the saturation down i think it leaves a, a nicer finish so this is a combo of 
levels, selective color, and gradient map. And we'll pop in here, and there you can see. So to do the lips, it was a darken with the levels, it was selective color tweaking, and then reducing the overall opacity using the gradient map. Now, for you newbies out there, it, this may seem quite intense or quite in complex, but the actual fundamental building blocks of doing all of this are very straightforward and simple. And we've done individual tutorials for each one of these processes. And a video like this is daisy chaining all of those processes together to show you how you can combine them to get results like this. So this process that you see in here is skin softening. And I basically created a duplicate of the head layer, went into filter camera raw and went luminescence and grain. And this, because the, the human skin has pores and looks realistic, I wanted to soften the skin. So I like to use luminescence for that and still add a tiny bit of grain for a bit of texture so it's not completely plastic. But because this is a synthetic being, I wanted to remove some of those natural pores and, and make it look a bit more inhuman. So that's the process that you're seeing here. All of the stuff that's going on for the skin is one layer group. So selective color is going on here because I want that inhuman skin to be a lot paler than the healthy tone of the original model. Again, a dedicated tutorial. I've, I've done a whole video on how to use selective color. It's very powerful. I like it because it's so fast. You can do a lot of stuff with it in a very short amount of time. Um, for recoloring skin, because you can go into all the individual channels, it's just so fast and so effective. And if you get the tone that you want and you just want to take down a saturation a bit more, you can always go hue saturation and have an, a separate adjustment layer to bring the tones down even more to reduce the color information. So with the adjustment layer active using a bulk standard soft edge brush, nothing fancy with the flow. Um, it's just 100% opacity and 100% flow. Now you'll notice an issue here with the color and the hair and the eyebrows the the selective color has actually made the edge of the hair go a greeny tone if we zoom in a bit you can see that that greeny tone is affecting the hair now i have a go-to method for making sure that the hair isn't affected by skin tone is it's a little bit complicated it's a little bit convoluted but i'm hoping i can explain that to you properly now so just a little bit of a tidy up here want to make sure that the ear is colored correct the same as everything else so we're going around make sure that that ear is sorted out from time to time you'll have to go through and yeah so we've got a dedicated ear mask there new selection layer and then we fill all of those skin color layers just some adjustment layers just to make sure the ear is the same as the skin tones on the face now this is the point where i want to separate i want to create a selection of the hair and the i think the eyebrow as well so the method is get the freehand lasso tool create a selection around the hair it doesn't have to be perfect it's just a rough selection and what we'll be using is refine edge just to soften those edges and make it um, a bit better than just straight up uh, lasso. So this is the initial selection. When you're using the lasso, use shift to add to the selection and use alt to take away from the selection. So there I'm adding the eyebrow too. And that needs to go on its own layer. So that one was called hair edge mask filled with white. And then once that selection is active, go to Refine Edge, go onto the original head layer, and when you push the radius, it will soften up those edges. So here we go, Hair Edge, Refine Edge, 
and then fill that with white. A fast way to fill a selection with white is Alt and Delete. Now with that selection, what we can now do is make sure that the hair is its own color and it's not being corrupted by the skin tones. So we have a dedicated selection layer that we can just grab that hair selection and eyebrow selection and make sure that that's a, a good tone that matches the overall piece. So there's a, a couple of steps involved in that, but I've, I've found it's, it works quite well um, because doing it by hand with a brush can be really tricky sometimes. So good old go-to there, gradient map adjustment layer to control the hair. Now you'll see it's not perfect. At this point, you can use a soft edge brush just to tweak those edges and get those last remnants of brown hair out the way. Now this is a nice fancy bit. The uh, cyborg head element at a similar angle to the model placed over the head and scaled and then right click on the layer, go blend in options layer style and then use blend if by holding down the alt keys and tweaking those arrows and that will change the way that it reacts with the layer below. Um, Abby Esparza did a great video that explains blend if in depth and you'll find that with most of the guys on the PM team we all use blend if loads. Now the reason why blend if is better than just changing the layer blend mode to overlay or soft light is that you have a lot more control on how the layer that you want to blend onto the layer below uh, reacts with the information below. So I've got the cyborg or android element over the top of the um, photo stock face. I use blend if to um, transition and blend it into the photo stock below. And now with a layer mask, painting away elements, using the pen tool for the sharp parts and then using a large soft edge brush to get um, a more tapered transition going in. And this adds a bit of a, a glossy effect to the cyborg image. And what you're seeing here is simply a layer mask with a black soft edge brush to taper in and control the opacity of that layer that's had the blend if done to it. So yeah, this is this is one of the best steps really. You can see it really coming together. If you want to control uh, the flow, I've discovered recently that flow works so much better than opacity if you want to have a more gentle touch with any kind of brush work. So I knew I wanted a part of the face to be whiter to match um, that bionic element. So it was just painted on with white and then using that uh, blend if function again to blend that in. And that's how those regions and panels and glossy area of the face was implemented. Big old soft edge brush, not too fancy. And then the reason why I didn't use um, an adjustment layer for coloring that panel CG element over the top of the head is because I just wanted that to match the skin tones. I have a saved duplicate in case I do something wrong. So in cases where you don't use adjustment layers, as long as you've got a duplicate, a copy of that element, then you know you're you're safe. Okay, the electrodes. There's another dirty trick here. It's a really really um, dirty trick. Basically, you duplicate the layer that you want a shadow for. You use levels to make that 100% black, and then you nudge that black layer to replicate the shadows so you see i've got the source image there visible and i'm copying what i can see on the source image 
using that filled black layer as a duplicate of the wires and the electrodes to copy um, what's on the source image. As I said before, I only cut out the wires. I didn't cut out the uh, shadows as well. So I knew I'd have to come back and manually create those shadows. You can also see the same technique being used for where the wires are. So instead of trying to manually create these shadows, I've literally created a duplicate and I'm using that duplicated black layer with some Gaussian blur or maybe some um, layer opacity to increase or decrease the strength. If there's only one thing that you learn from this tutorial, if you can take this trick, it's an amazing trick and it works really, really well in so many different situations. So it's really coming together now. You've seen how all the different elements and panels have been cut out and combined. You've seen how to steal shadows. You've seen how to refer back to the original photo stock for getting scale, transforming and rotating. Or how you can edit and manipulate certain elements of the kind of CG aspect of the image using the pen tool to create precise selections and adjustment layers. So there's a lot going on in this one. I know it's move, moving at a mean clip, but this is more of a combination of all of the smaller skills that we teach on the channel. This gives, gives you context and an overview of how all those different techniques come together to create a finalized piece. Now, on this uh, chin strap or yeah, jaw strap element, I wanted a catch light. Um, if that was a real object, it would catch uh, white light on the edge. So all I'm doing is I'm creating a path and I'm filling that path with whatever color that I want the catch white to be. So I'm just using foreground color there and then delete the path and what you're left with is that catch light now I didn't want that to be um, really sharp 0.5 add a layer mask hit B for brush and then just taper that off as needed so those catch light elements you can manually create them whenever you want right so I'm using more neo stock bits here um, from the ultimate cable bundle now the intention for this piece was to be a portrait piece not a full body so I'm tweaking and arranging and manipulating elements in the background. I'm not going to go in depth on what I'm doing here with these cables because the main focus is on the the cyborg uh, head and shoulders pretty much. But I, ju I just kept this in so you guys could see my workflow of taking these CG cable elements and twisting them around. There, there's no rhyme or reason to this. It was just me messing about with bits and using the free transform tool just to see okay does this look good does that look good and then just chopping or adding as necessary but like i said um, that's not the whole main point of the tutorial or the walkthrough uh, if you like these tubes you can get them from neo stock they're available as a bundle okay so we've got a little bit more of the background put together now pushing the direction of this piece and what I like to do in situations like this where the background is very dark is to normally have uh, a backlight element. It's normally, there you go, white circle um, with a Gaussian blur just to push that focal element forward. It's, it's a really simple, really nice technique. Um, to get rid of gradient banding, you can use filter, camera raw, and grain i find the camera raw grain is a, is a really good method for knocking out the, that gradient banding so we're getting to the home stretch on this one guys another one of my go-to tricks um for lightening eyes is creating a pen tool selection around the iris or the pupil and using the levels commands to really push those levels up to the point where it's not 100 percent white but it retains some of the details. I actually did an entire tutorial on that, the Evil Eyes tutorial. So if you're interested in that technique, you can check that out in the description below. Like you saw earlier with the catch light on the edge of the chin strap, 
uh, we're going through a similar process here. So it's a new layer and then a path created with the pen tool. And then that path is filled with whatever you need, whether it's darks, lights, whether it's a shadow of a panel, whether it's a highlight. In this instance, it's a catch light. So that was filled with white. And then tapered in using the layer mask. So that's add layer mask, B soft edge brush, and then just taper out the edges as needed. So these little catch light elements, you can always just make them manually if they don't exist. Dirty go to shadow levels and then selectively add it in. So you use levels, you make it go darker, everything's black and then using um, a white soft edge brush, selectively add, ah, tell a lie on this one is multiply. So it's a combination of both. One layer with multiply, one layer with levels. So you sample a dark color, make a new layer, change it to multiply and then paint in that shadow. Multiply um, is a lot stronger and a lot starker. You can mute the tones a lot better with multiply shadows. Got a little bit of housekeeping here with those shadows cast by the cables. Maybe if they're too strong, they need to have the opacity pulled down a bit. And then a go-to shadow technique, levels, always a winner. So what you're seeing here is some basic light shaping. Um, the main figure is, is kind of coming out of the shadows. So I simply used a levels adjustment layer um, made that dark and then using a very large white soft edge brush selectively painting in that shadow onto the body and because the body selection was active command click on the layer icon I could paint that shadow in a massive broad stroke going over. So once some basic light shaping has been done, it's just a case of some global processing. I usually like to use um, a process that uses the Photoshop oil paint, and that's creating a stamped layer, Command, Alt, Shift, and E. So that's everything copied and pasted to the top as a stamped layer. And then you making one layer as a high pass and putting that up to about three or four. And then on the layer underneath, using the oil paint, you can reduce the shine to zero. And then you make the high pass visible and change that to overlay to pick out the details again. Um, if you're interested in this oil paint technique for finishing off or post-processing artworks, again, there's an entire dedicated tutorial for that in the description below. Like I said before, it's all tiny constituent techniques all pulled together to make more fancy in-depth artwork so at this stage guys i hope i've given you some inspiration and ideas for combining cg elements you don't have to use adobe stock or neo stock for creating a piece like this you can source or grab your cg elements uh, from wherever you can get them for free legally um there's tons and tons on Adobe stock. There's tons and tons on Neo stock. So if you're not familiar with those sites, go and check them out. If you're interested in taking your artwork to the next level. And here we just have some basic post-processing. Um, this is an iris blur, which creates a faux depth of field effect. And here you can see it being used for the finishing touch to wrap this one up. Now the final image actually had a bit of digital overpainting. I got my Cintiq out of storage and started using it. So I didn't want to do that as a full tutorial because this one's already knocking on to the 40 minutes mark. But I'm going to be doing some dedicated walkthroughs and tutorials to show you how you can digitally overpaint. I want to get a bit better at it myself before I start showing other people how to do it. So I've still got some 
experimentation to do myself. But when it comes to combining CG and Photostock elements in Photoshop, I like to feel I've got pretty decent at it because I've been doing it for so long. And this is the type of workflow that I'll typically use for creating my book cover artworks because my clients always ask me to do wacky and zany stuff. You normally need to use CG elements for extreme sci-fi work or horror work, which are the two genres that I'm involved in the most. So I normally get the really wacky jobs that most other um, digital artists in the photo manipulation space can't get their heads around. Made a nice little niche for myself. So that's it for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to check out my other long-form walkthrough breakdown videos. I'm going to leave a couple for you at the end, on the end cards, so you can check them out. Appreciate you tuning in today, guys, and enjoy the videos coming up. Thanks for tuning in. Catch you in the next video. See you then.